All right. All right, let's get started. Um, let me get the lights and whatnot adjusted. Okay, is that good for everybody, everybody can see? Okay, all right. So um, let's talk about uh, just some brief announcements for today. So I'm gonna get the sign-in sheet passed around. All right, so your first homework assignment, I have posted that on Blackboard and it should uh, pop up like right now. I, I have everything set to, uh, to pop up uh, at the beginning of class. Um, uh, throughout the lecture and, and probably a little bit at the end when we finish our, our discussion on, on just introductory concepts and measurements, uh, I will probably um, just, you know, just sort of highlight some stuff that, uh, that you might want to pay attention to as you're working on the homework. Now it's due on Tuesday, September 5th uh, at the beginning of lecture, so we only have two lectures between now and, uh, you know, when it's due we'll have a lecture uh, next Tuesday and next Thursday, and then it's due. So at the beginning of class for, you know, uh, for, for the next two lectures, I'll try and make sure and say, hey, does anybody have any questions about the homework? So because we only have two, I mean, you probably want to at least give it the once over uh, and try and get started on it. Um, just on, I also put this here, uh, submission formatting guidelines. This is, I just screen captured that directly out of the syllabus. Just make sure you have a cover page on it. Just put your name, uh, the course. I'm not worried about the section number because there's only one section. Um, the course, uh, homework number, and just the due date, just so I can keep track of it uh, between this and structural analysis. You know, I, I say this, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and just actually put civil engineering materials because I'm teaching CE 321 and CE 312. That's really easy to get that mixed up. So put civil engineering materials on there just to help me not mix that up. Um, uh, just make sure, and I'm, I'm pretty easy uh, when it comes to formatting, just make sure it's legible. Uh, you know, if there's any diagrams, make sure you're using uh, straight edges and things like that. Make sure you're numbering all your pages. You know, if there's three pages, one out of three, two out of three, three out of three, just so uh, that's more for your sake than it is for mine, so that if something gets lost, we know, uh, we know where it is. <coughs> Everybody good so far? Okay. Now I'm going to lecture um, probably you know, for, for the full class period, maybe a little bit shorter, but I figure uh, I want to get into the habit of actually you know, lecturing and then taking a little bit of a break and then meeting back at two. So if we finish a little early, uh, I figure that's fine. It gives everybody a chance to um, you know, take a break, use the restroom uh, and what have you. That probably isn't going to be that big of a deal uh, this week because our lab today is going to be fairly short, but on s some days, like for instance, the days we'll do our mixed designs, the labs, they really will be kind of long, so the break will, will be uh, uh, welcomed, I, I can tell you that. So I, I want to sort of uh, get in that habit. So we'll lecture for a little bit, um, uh, take a break, and meet back at 2 o'clock. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about lab and, and what we're going to do uh, uh, when that gets started. Any questions? Um, one other thing I'll point out, I have already um, assigned lab groups. I'll show you how I did that in lab. I think you'll get a, uh, a kick out of it. But everybody's lab groups are already divided, and that'll be your lab group throughout the semester. And honestly, m in most cases, your lab group really, I don't, I'll try and choose my words carefully, but it's not really going to matter a whole lot because all your lab group will do will be collect the data together. But everybody individual will be individually, blah, will be doing the work. So that's not, uh, that's not gonna be too much of a hindrance or, or big deal uh, throughout the semester. Everybody good so far? Okay, all right. So today I want to continue our discussion on just some introductory concepts before we start really digging into civil engineering materials. And the way the class works is we tend to take one uh, material at a time and, and sort of uh, elaborate. So we'll talk about aggregate, then we'll talk about cement, then we'll talk about concrete, then we'll talk about steel. So we just sort of take uh, one material at a time. But before we do that, uh, a few more introductory concepts and, and fundamental ideas uh, that we'll need to go through. Um, so let's see. Is that still? Okay. Okay. Um, let me back a, a couple slides. Probably somewhere about uh, right here. Okay, this is a good place, I think, to sort of recap. So if you recall last time, we defined some fundamental, uh, I guess, properties of materials, you know, why this class is important, why um, you would select one material versus another, things like 
availability, economy, what the materials uh, intended use is, uh, and et cetera. And then we started delving into some fundamental concepts of stress and strain. And we basically arrived at these two uh, fundamental equations. The idea that if you have some body subjected to some load P and it has a cross-sectional area A, then you can compute the stress as P over A. Likewise, if you have some element uh, that has an original length L and it has been stretched some amount delta, some change in length, then the change in length divided by the original length is its strain. Everybody okay with that, with that concept? That's good because you will be using that on your first homework, so I want to make sure everybody's uh, okay with that. Um, also, in the linear relationship, or in the linear range of a material's behavior, we recognize there's a relationship between the applied stress and the resulting strain, and we call that the Young's modulus, or the modulus of elasticity. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that today and some different types of uh, uh, material uh, behaviors that can be, um, that can be uh, uh, investigated and implemented or, um, uh, or, or learned about. Um, <coughs> the, as we discussed last time, the, the fundamental or one of the most fundamental uh, uh, tools or pieces of information that we can use in regards to a given material to understand its behavior is a stress-strain curve. And a stress-strain curve comes from taking a, a sample like this, be it a, uh, a, uh, a tensile element or a compressive element, and essentially loading it until failure and recording the response. You, and you know, when you do that test, you'll mo more likely get uh, results uh, in something like force and then deformation. But using those fundamental equations, you can convert that to stress and strain and arrive at unique uh, data for a given material. So the one on the left, that is the stress-strain curve for low carbon steel. Doesn't matter what the specimen looked like, whether it was an A505 specimen or a Darwin specimen or what have you, by converting to stress and strain, you get the same curve for that given material. And that's why stress-strain curves uh, are so valuable. So this is a typical stress-strain curve for carbon steel. The one on the right is for uh, an aluminum alloy. And we took a stress-strain curve last time and we started to investigate the different, um, the different uh, 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 components of the curve, the different um, uh, regions of the curve, what was elastic, what was inelastic, uh, and what have you. So we started off, we looked at uh, the first part of the curve, that linear region, and we defined the slope of that region as Young's modulus. Uh, again, this is stuff we talked about last time. We have uh, uh, a point to bring up that, that elastic behavior can be linear and can be nonlinear. Uh, as well. Uh, it tends to be nonlinear in materials like, uh, like concretes. <coughs> um, we also mentioned that materials sometimes don't have well-defined yield points. That's why we uh, use approaches like the offset method. We'll look at this stuff later on uh, when we start delving into uh, specific materials, but it's just something I wanted to uh, uh, have in the back of your minds as we move forward. And again, there's other uh, uh, aspects and ways of uh, computing that modulus as well. Okay, um, for, for a typical metal like this, we have the onset of yielding, and yielding is that point when the, the metal or the alloy uh, freely deforms under a, uh, a given set of load. And again, that happens because those bonds between the, uh, the atoms and the molecules are, are beginning to give. They're beginning to separate. So that's why you get that, that free amount of deformation. Uh, once the, uh, the bonds realign, the material begins to... Uh, uh, accept load again, and that's where the, uh, uh, the, the CD region uh, comes in. It begins to accept load a little bit more. Until that happens, once the occurs, you know the uh, material is about ready to give. You see that central region experiencing a very, very high amount of stress, so much so that it's beginning to give and give and give until it fractures. Okay? So is everybody okay with that? Anybody have any questions about that? That's a, a pretty fundamental um, uh, curve and a very fundamental topic for a class like this. Everybody good so far? Okay. All right. Now, um, I think we we uh, we stop uh, right around here. I want to um, I want to uh, I want to actually take a moment and look at uh, at this image because I want to help uh, exp just help explain what's going on with the two curves. Now, if you notice, uh, I've got here this stress strain curve, and there's actually uh, two curves, right? There's a, there's a solid curve and then there's this dashed curve that's sort of trailing up, okay? 
And the difference between the two is, is what's called the difference between engineering stress and strain and true stress and strain. Now, let me, uh, let me sort of explain what's going on by looking at this. Would you agree that, I mean, you, you agree that our fundamental stress equation is P rate, right? We take the force and we divide it by the area to get stress, right? That's one point, but would you also agree that throughout the test, the area is changing, right? Now, this is a very pronounced uh, uh, point when the area is changing, but look here. The area here is much smaller here than it was before, right? So smaller area would theoretically mean larger stress, right? If sigma equals P over A, that's more stress. Make sense? In reality, what's happening here is the stress is actually shooting up. It's getting larger and larger and larger. But for the purposes of what uh, we typically uh, need uh, as engineers, instead of tracking that area and plotting that out as the, uh, uh, as the member is loaded, what we tend to do is keep things simple. Instead of uh, dividing by the area as the, the bar is being loaded, we say, you know what, let's just keep it simple. When we do sigma equals P over A uh, to define this curve, we'll just divide by the original area all the time. We just set a, a single value and divide. So that's where the difference comes between a true stress strain curve and an engineering stress strain curve. An engineering stress strain curve, we're just dividing by the original length and the original area. Whereas a true stress strain curve is trying to account for the fact that the geometry is changing throughout the test. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, so that's why you'll have a, a, a little bit of a trail off, especially in that nonlinear region uh, as the member uh, is giving up. So um, <coughs> we're, all, we're always going to use engineering stress and strain uh, in this course, but uh, if you're ever tested on it, if you're ever um, uh, quizzed about, well, what is the difference between engineering stress strain and true stress strain, engineering stress strain relies on the original geometry, whereas true stress and strain relies on the geometry changing throughout the test. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay. All right. Now, what I want to do is introduce you all to some terminology. Um, if I start throwing words at you like elastic behavior, plastic behavior, what's a proportional limit, what's an ultimate stress, and what have you, I, I want you to understand what that means. So I want us to, uh, to, to be able to speak in the same terminology. I mean, this class, don't get me wrong, there are some computations and some math associated with what we do in this class, but a lot of uh, what I am after, a lot of what I am trying to get you to learn when you take this course is the terminology, the language. You know, what is the difference between coarse and fine aggregate? There is a little bit of memorization uh, uh, associated with this course. It's sort of is the nature of a class like this. So I want to introduce you to, to some of these materials. Now, elastoplastic behavior uh, is basically just sort of a combination of trying to relate when a material behaves elastically and when it behaves plastically. So I think I, I've uh, used elastic behavior enough to, uh, to easily define that. So if we're talking about elastic behavior, we're talking about behavior where um, you know, we apply a load, a material deforms. We let that load go, it goes back to its original shape. It snaps back. That's elastic behavior. Plastic behavior is when we have the onset of permanent deformations. You know, think about the, pa uh, the paper clip. Um, you take that paper clip and you bend it and it stays bent. Or imagine if you have a, a can of, an empty can of Coca-Cola. You take it and you crush it. It's not going back to its original shape. It's crushed, right? You have, that is extreme plastic behavior. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so I, I want everybody to understand the difference uh, between the, the concept of elastic behavior and the concept of plastic behavior. Uh, again, let me also mention, if I'm ever going too fast or if you're taking notes and you need me to stop, just say, well, we'll go back a few, okay? Very easy to, to get along with in those regards. I want you all to learn, so. Okay. <laughs> Some definitions, okay? So proportional limit, okay, so the proportional limit of the material is the transition between when a material is behaving linearly and when a material is behaving non-linearly. So I'm going to go back a couple slides to try and illustrate this. 
It's kind of tough to see right here, but if you notice, we have a, a linear region from our origin uh, O to A. Um, and it, you know, you'd think, well, it's linear and then it yields, but, but not really. Going from zero to A, there's sort of a point when it kind of, it stops being linear and it starts to, to curve over and give like that. That makes sense? Everybody kind of kind of see that right here? If I were to zoom in, it would sort of go up and then sort of go like that. That point when that nonlinear behavior begins is what's called the proportional limit. If you ever hear me mention the proportional limit, that's what I'm talking about, okay? Make sense? We okay with that? Okay, so the elastic limit, uh, uh, you probably won't hear me use the term elastic limit very much, especially when I'm talking about alloys, because I tend to just use the yield stress. It's essentially the point when it stops behaving uh, elastically, and, start, and it's the transition between elastic and then full-on plastic behavior. So for uh, a metal, we're talking about this plateau uh, right here, that point when it just starts to uh, uh, fully yield. Uh, speaking of yielding, yielding is that phenomenon when those bonds are beginning to break. So we're getting an increase in deformation with little or no increase in load at all. So uh, as the load is constant, it's just continuing to deform. That's what yielding is, okay? Now, <clears throat> the ultimate stress is the maximum stress that the given material can withstand. And we report that ultimate stress based on the engineering stress strain curve. So if we're talking about a metal, our ultimate stress, our ultimate strength is essentially uh, uh, right here. So for instance, when we test uh, concrete cylinders, that's gonna be one of the, uh, the values that we're after when we uh, uh, test those cylinders, because that will help us uh, yield a quantity that is very, very important in reinforced concrete, which is FC prime, the compressive strength of a given uh, sample of concrete. And that's what we're going to be after. This is obviously a, a stress strain curve for a metal, but just wanted to, uh, to illustrate that. Everybody good so far? Okay. <laughs> All right. The rupture stress, the rupture stress is right here. That's when the, uh, the element uh, uh, like physically separates, taking the element, loading it. Remember that video when it sort of popped? That's the rupture stress when it actually, uh, when it actually separates. So that gets into a, a definition I think I mentioned a little last time, the difference between brittle behavior and ductile uh, behavior. Ductile uh, materials exhibit a lot of plastic deformation uh, before failure. Um, to give you kind of an idea, this is actually a really uh, much better image to kind of give you all some scale uh, about what's going on with structural steel. Um, steel is an incredibly ductile material. It can withstand a lot of inelastic deformation. To give you kind of an idea, remember, this is the elastic range, okay? Everything out here is inelastic, okay? If you want some scale added to this, the best way of thinking about it is a football field, okay? So this right here, this is the end zone, okay? This point right here, when it starts to yield, that's the one yard line, okay? So from the zero, from the end zone to the one yard line, that's the elastic behavior. And in most cases, that's where we limit uh, the stresses in, in steel design. Okay, so this is the one yard line. That's the 10 yard line. That's the other end zone. So think. The elastic behavior is just from the zero to the one yard line. Everything else is all that inelastic deformation. That's why steel works very well in situations of, of high stress, like earthquake design uh, and what have you, where you see a lot of very high stresses. You need uh, that ductility. Now, again, steel is a, a ductile material. Um, it gives you a, a lot of warning before, uh, before it fails. You see a lot of deformation before, uh, before failure. Uh, brittle materials like concrete, not so much. I mean, when, when concrete goes by itself, when it goes, it goes quick, okay? So concrete is an example of a brittle material. Another example is, is something like glass, you know? And if I were to uh, take my hand, let's say, let's say I, you know, I had a piece of glass and I just started pressing, it really wouldn't exhibit that deformation. It'd hit that point and pew, it would go, okay? That's, that's brittle behavior, okay? Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay. All right. Um, getting a little fancier on you, but these are 
or topics that are that are um, that are that are worth discussing. I want to talk a little bit about some other terms. One of them uh, is a is a concept called visco viscoelastic behavior. And uh, when you hear the term viscoelastic behavior, basically it's elastic behavior. But but essentially what you're throwing into it. Uh, is the concept of either time or temperature, specifically more often time. So, so the idea is if I have a material and I apply a load on it, there's a little bit of a delay before that material responds and begins to deform. A very, very uh, uh, common example of a material that we would be exposed to that is viscoelastic is a material like asphalt. Okay? So the idea is that when you apply a load to asphalt, there's a little bit of a delay, and the material sort of has to like catch up before it, uh, it receives that load and begins to respond uh, and deform. Visco uh, elastic material behavior is, is a function of, of time. You know, there's a little bit of that delay, but it's also a function of temperature. I mean, materials like asphalt tend to uh, behave uh, quite differently under different temperatures. Okay? And usually what ends up happening is that um, the warmer it is or the hotter it is, the more ductile the material is. Colder, it gets uh, a little more brittle. Okay? So everybody okay with that? Any questions? <laughs> All right. Some additional mechanical properties. This is stuff I may just throw out at you. I just want to see if you um, uh, understand this or, or remember this. This is, this is prime candidates for stuff I throw on an exam just to test your memories. Okay, so if I ever uh, uh, mention the word toughness, what, what is the toughness of a given material? The toughness of a given material is nothing more than the energy required uh, to reach fracture. And the way that we define that is the area under the curve. So for toughness, it's the area under the curve from zero all the way to, uh, to fracture. For the modulus of resilience, it's essentially the same thing, only instead of going to fracture, we're going to the, uh, to the yield point. Okay. Does that make sense? You want me to hang out here for a second? I mentioned the, the word exam, and everybody's, oh. Of course, we don't have exams in my classes. We have celebrations of learning, so. I hadn't thrown that, cur that, that term out this semester. Something's wrong with me. Man. All right. Everybody good? OK. Um, this is a very uh, uh, important topic for the folks who are interested in highway bridges. And this is uh, a curve that relates to a material's behavior under the presence of fatigue. Now, now what do I mean by fatigue? OK. Now, Let's say you have two Coke cans, okay, and you've got the, the tab on top of the Coke can, right? Now, you could just take that tab, rip it off. That would take a little bit of muscle, right? What's another way of getting that tab off the can? You take and you do that, right? You sort of wiggle, wiggle the, the tab off. You know what I'm talking about, right? What's happening is this. You are taking that tab, that aluminum alloy, and you are subjecting it to a fatigue event. You're taking it, you're loading it, and you're unloading it, loading it, and unloading it, loading it, and unloading it, and it's failing. And what's happening is, by doing that, you are softening the material's response, and it fails at a lower load. Right? It makes sense that it would be harder to just rip the tab off than it would be to apply that fatigue event. Material gets softer and a little weaker. Make sense? OK. Now, that particular phenomenon is what's called low cycle fatigue. I mean, you're not, you're not sitting there and doing that for hours. You take it, you do it a few times, it comes right off. There's only a few cycles of load. Okay? By applying those few cycles of load, um, you're able to fail the, the element at a lower stress, but you actually have to deform it quite a bit. I mean, you can't just do that. You have to bend the tab all the way back a few different times uh, before it fails. The, the point is, is that if you take an element and, and, and introduce the concept of fatigue, the more cycles of load that you apply, the, the lower its capacity. Um, now, if we're talking about, a, uh, uh, if we're talking about you know, something like a Coke can, it only takes a, a few cycles of load, but you have to apply a lot of stress. Bridges, it's a little bit of a different story. Bridges, um, they don't see low cycle fatigue. They see high cycle fatigue. I mean, think about it. Uh, 
you know, the, the, the design life of a bridge in the United States is 75 years. So uh, that's just a tidbit for you uh, folks that are interested in bridges. We design bridges in the U.S. for 75 years. So there's 365 days in a year, 75 years in a design life, and then take that and multiply it by how many cars you think travel across an average bridge in a given day. That's a lot of cycles of load, right? So if you've got a steel that uh, has a yield stress of 50 KSI, that's great. But under fatigue uh, considerations, its maximum capacity might only be something like 12 KSI. Okay? So it's definitely something you have to consider uh, in those applications. Now what ends up happening with materials like metals is uh, there, there, uh, there is a point uh, that occurs. It's, uh, here it's called the endurance limit. I might call it the endurance limit. I might call it the fatigue threshold. Uh, they're, they're sort of interchangeable terms. There's a point where it really doesn't matter how many cycles you apply, there's sort of a lower bound limit on the capacity. So, uh, you know, for, for given uh, details, you know, it might be 12 KSI or 6 KSI uh, or what have you. So it's just something I, I wanted you to mention or wanted you to be aware of. This is sort of the region of low cycle fatigue and this would be a high cycle fatigue. A lot of times when we're designing highway bridges, we design it sort of in this region. So the idea is it doesn't matter how many trucks drive over the bridge, it's not going to fail. Okay? Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, I have a little animation here, but, but I think it, it, it uh, explains the concept quite well. And this is something you'll also want to pay attention to for your homework because this is going to pop up. Um, so this is uh, what you're seeing uh, here, this animation, is what's called the Poisson's effect. Now, I guarantee you, you saw this when you took mechanics of deformable bodies. Again, I know everybody's such a big fan of that. But um, uh, if it's been a while, I want to uh, illustrate, um, want to illustrate what's going on. So if you have an element and you yank on it, it gets longer, right? But that's not all that happens. It gets longer, but it also gets thinner. Make sense? Okay. Likewise, if I took that element and squished it, it would get shorter, but it would also get wider. Make sense? There is a ratio that is specific to a given material that relates how much strain you have longitudinally to how much strain you have laterally. We call that Poisson's ratio. So it's the Greek letter nu. And essentially, if we take the lateral strain, how much we get this way, and the longitudinal strain, how much we get this way, and we divide the two, that will give us uh, Poisson's ratio. The reason for the, uh, the negative sign is, is you know, just think about the behavior of what's going on. If you're taking an element and stretching it, it's getting longer one way, so longer, positive deformation, but it's getting shorter this way. So negative deformation this way. So if you take the values and just divide them, you'll get a negative answer. So that's why we throw another negative so the Poisson's ratio comes out positive. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Now again, uh, uh, Poisson's ratio is a number that is specific to a given material. It's a lot like Young's modulus. Young's modulus is a material-specific quantity. There's a different uh, E value for steel than there is for aluminum or for concrete, uh, et cetera. So for brass, for any brass, the Poisson's ratio is 0.34. For different grades of structural steel, it's anywhere from about 0.27 to 0.3. In most structural steel applications, we use 0.3. <coughs> Bless you. Okay. So the, here's a couple of uh, values. Oh, that's from uh, uh, deformable bodies. Don't worry about that. No, that's actually from the Mechanics and Materials book. If you still have your Mechanics and Materials book, it's in Appendix I. So. Um, yeah, I don't think our book lists uh, Poisson's ratio in the appendix. But that's really all you will need. And if you have any problems uh, in, in a homework assignment or exam, this is one of those things. I'm not expecting you to really remember these types of values. So if you have something like this, uh, I'll more than likely give them to you. Okay. <coughs> any questions so far? All right. Okay. So everything uh, that we've been talking about uh, so far uh, has been uh, related to materials mechanical behavior. And what I mean by mechanical behavior is you take an element, you push on it or you pull on it, you apply some force, and that material responds. And everything we've been talking about has been trying to characterize that response, whether it's elastic behavior or viscoelastic behavior or what have you. 
it's all about that mechanical uh, phenomenon, taking an element, applying load, observing its response. There are also very important properties related to material that are non-mechanical. They don't have a thing to do with uh, applying loads to it uh, and, and observing its response. Some of those uh, properties are very important to us as civil engineers. Things like density and unit weight. You all know the difference between density and unit weight? If not, no big deal. This is uh, a good place to learn. So density uh, is defined as the mass per unit volume, whereas unit weight is the weight per unit volume. Okay? A lot of times in civil engineering applications, we're not as worried about density as we are as, uh, about unit weight because, you know, we're, we're always on, on Earth, you know. So we just, a lot of times we'll end up just going with, uh, with unit weight, okay? Um, have you ever heard the term specific gravity before? Okay, I think if you've had fluids, this is probably, you probably heard it in there, um, but uh, specific gravity is essentially a quantity that will tell you how much heavier a given material is than water, okay? So for instance, if a material has a specific gravity of two, it's twice as heavy as water, okay? Does that make sense? So um, uh, this is a, a great way of explaining uh, the, the, the concrete canoe. A lot of times you'll have folks who aren't engineers and they'll hear about the concrete canoe and they're thinking, how do you make a canoe out of concrete? Isn't concrete heavier than water? Well, yeah, but let's look at structural steel. Structural steel has a specific gravity of about 7.8. So it's about seven, almost eight times heavier than water. And they make aircraft carriers out of steel, so it obviously works. You can make a canoe out of concrete, and it'll work uh, as well. All right, does that make sense? So specific gravity and, and density and unit weight are be going to become very important concepts for us uh, as we move forward. It seems simple, but sometimes there are some challenges that you might not think of that we have to be able to assess uh, when we move forward. Like for instance, one of our first materials that we're going to, uh, uh, one of the, or the first material uh, in a civil engineering context we're going to investigate uh, is aggregate. Okay. Well, if you pull a sample of aggregate and you pull a sample of aggregate and you pull a sample of aggregate, I guarantee you if you weigh each of those samples, even if they come from the same place uh, and the same source, you're going to get different uh, weights and ultimately different specific gravities. I mean, your sample uh, might be in a looser fashion uh, than someone else's. Uh, is it loose? Is it compacted? Do the particular uh, particles have voids uh, or not? Um, what about uh, moisture? Maybe your sample has a different moisture content uh, than another. And that's a really big one uh, for aggregates and specifically for uh, civil engineering context. So that stuff matters and it can, it can change um, what we uh, think of uh, w when it comes to density, maybe there are different densities and different uh, moisture states uh, that we need to consider. Um, additional non-mechanical concepts. Um, what about corrosion and degradation or, or surface characteristics? Um, you know, if we're talking about a, a material, all materials uh, corrode, all, or all materials deteriorate over time, maybe I should say that. Uh, we need to account for that, and we also need to select materials that are compatible uh, with one another. Um, what about things like, like surface texture? Um, uh, surface texture, for instance, uh, if we're looking at, at coarse aggregate, at gravel. Gravel is one of the main components that goes into concrete, okay? And a, uh, an aggregate surface texture, whether or not it's smooth or rough, can affect the workability of that concrete. So it's a really important characteristic uh, that needs to be accounted for. Um, <coughs> so, everybody, everybody okay with that? All right. Now, this is a big one, and this, I'll say, this, this isn't, I don't know if it's so much a materials concept as it, is, as it is just a civil engineering concept. Um, there's, a, there's an old uh, funny saying that when it comes to civil engineering, there's really only two things that you need to know, and that's factors of safety and that stuff rolls downhill. Um, and that's civil engineering in a nutshell, although stuff isn't really the, the word that's used. Um, but um, <laughs> but, um, but there, there is something to that. Factors of safety um, is one of, the, uh, uh, it's one of the most fundamental concepts that we as engineers uh, need to understand. So uh, a factor of safety is little more than a ratio between 
uh, what stress uh, we allow and what stress the material uh, can actually withstand. So, uh, for instance, if I have this table, all right, and, and I like to break things, my general philosophy is any day with controlled demolition is a good day. So I, I go down to the lab or something like that and I start applying load until this uh, table begins to fail. And let's say I keep going, going, going. And let's make up a number. Let's say the table fails at about 800 pounds. So 800 pounds, the table fractures in half. Now, let's say I am a table manufacturer and I'm selling this table to uh, an end user like Marshall University. What I might say to them is the maximum allowable capacity on this table is not 800 pounds. I'll say, you know what, the fact is you can only put 400 pounds on this. So I am incorporating a factor of safety of two in that statement. Does that make sense? The idea that the table can actually hold up 800 pounds, but I'm not going to let that happen. I am only going to let the user uh, load this table with up to 400 pounds. Does that make sense? That's a very important concept uh, in engineering. And factors of safety and uh, uh, their use are determined by a number of things. I got a few folks in here that have had me for steel and concrete. And um, they know that a lot of the factors of safety that we use do come from, uh, from codes and, and specifications. For instance, we, uh, we have different uh, 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 load factors that we apply, for instance, to dead loads and live loads. Because there's a higher degree of uncertainty associated with live loads, and we can predict the dead loads a little better than we can the live, we bump up the live loads uh, a fair bit more. So one really big uh, aspect of factors of safety is we're trying to account for uncertainty. Maybe we're not 100% sure uh, about the, the loads and forces that are going to be applied, so we up our factor of safety a, a little bit. Um, it also goes, uh, you know, the, the material characteristics that we're using. If we're using concrete, concrete's going to behave a lot differently uh, than steel does. And then also, let's not forget, in the end, there's also a little bit of engineering judgment that goes into there. <coughs> now, when I say uh, actual stress, I'm, I'm talking about the actual stress that will cause failure. And failure is a term that tends to get thrown around kind of loosely in civil engineering. So what I mean by failure are things like fracture or rupture, or maybe the element is deflecting too much. I'm getting too much deformation. Maybe I've uh, exceeded its fatigue threshold. Uh, maybe it's just yielding. You know, if we're talking about an element in compression, maybe we're talking about buckling, okay? So just be clear when, when the word failure is thrown out, it could mean a lot of different things, okay? Everybody okay with that? Okay, so um, with that, uh, what I kind of want to close on today is I want to talk a little bit about measurement uh, uh, devices. I want to talk about measurement uh, in general, uh, uh, variability that we can see in our measurements. I'm not going to turn this into a statistics lecture, but um, I, I want to um, I want you all to recognize that there are uh, that there is variability in our measurements. There is uncertainty in our measurements. Um, and we need to uh, account for that. So it starts off with looking at measurement devices. Okay, There are really, in general, two types of ways that we can measure uh, response of materials, or, 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 or I say materials, but this is really just measuring anything. Okay, One of them is using direct devices. A very good example of a direct measurement device would be a ruler or, or a scale. Here's something, how long it is. It's that long. It's direct. Okay, it's right there. That's a direct uh, measurement. An indirect measurement is is not really measuring length or measuring force, but it's measuring some other quantity and then converting it back into force. I'll, I'll show you a really uh, 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 prominent example of that. It's called a strain gauge, and you'll you'll see what I uh, what I mean here in a second. Um, some important considerations that you need to consider when you take measurements. I get the feeling a lot of you all have seen the difference between precision and accuracy before in, in some other context, probably in a physics class or a chemistry class or something like that. But that uh, the idea that precision, the, uh, uh, the characteristic of measurements being close to one another, and accuracy means uh, being close to the actual true value. Just make sure you know the, uh, the difference between those. Um, some direct uh, measurement devices, again, uh, uh, direct measurement devices, things like a ruler, 
Uh, a stopwatch is a very common example of a, a direct measuring device because it directly will tell you time. Um, <laughs> another one uh, that we see a lot in civil engineering context is what's called a, uh, a dial gauge. And I want to kind of give you uh, an understanding of how a dial gauge works. Well, we're going to see them here and there in, uh, uh, in some of our, our laboratory settings, so I want you to understand how to read them. So everybody will probably want to pay attention uh, to this. So we're looking here at a dial gauge. Now dial gauges are used to, uh, to measure uh, deflections or distances that are, I mean, we're talking like you know, thousands and thousands of inches. So this, uh, this uh, particular uh, measuring device is accurate to within one ten thousandth of an inch. So really, really small, precise uh, deformations. But you can get when you do things like uh, uh, steel tension testing, you take an element and load it to failure. I mean, some of the deflections we are talking about, the, uh, the thousandth of an inch. Okay. So this, this uh, particular dial gauge accuracy to ten thousandth of an inch, its range is 0.4 inches. Okay. So what's going to happen is this, is this, um, this uh, long sort of measuring uh, uh, stick right here, this is going to uh, fling around the dial gauge uh, quite a bit as the readings are being taken. This one right here is basically showing you the limit uh, on, the, on the dial gauge. So this would be 0 0.0, this would be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and then once you get to 0 0.4, that's sort of the end of the, the measuring capability of that particular dial gauge you have reached the end of that, that uh, gauge's range. Does that make sense? So what we're looking at is, okay, so this has already gone around a number of times and cross point 0.1. So what this one is telling us is that our measurement is somewhere between point 0.1 and point 0.2. Make sense? And if all I was doing was looking at this, just this by itself, it would probably be like, what, point 0.11 or point 0.12, something about like that. Everybody make sense? Like if it was right, like, if it was right here, it'd be like 0.15. Am I okay with that? Okay, so this is 0.1 something, okay? And that's where this one comes into play. So when this one goes from 0 to 1, this one will have made one complete revolution. So this is 0.1. See, it's past 0.1, so it's 0.11, right? It's probably like, what, what 0 0.115, 0 0.116. Everybody see that? How do I get the rest? That's where the big dial comes in. So it's point one one five six. Bam. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? So I, I want you all to, to make sure that you understand how to read that. Uh, we might be seeing that as the uh, as the semester progresses. Everybody okay with that? Okay. <coughs> all right. Indirect uh, laboratory measuring devices, essentially electricity or some signal and try to convert it into a, uh, a, a, a measurement like distance or force or something like that. One very common one, one I used a lot when I was uh, in my master's and PhD research is what's called an LVDT. An LVDT stands for a linear variable differential transformer. That's a mouthful. That's why we call it an LVDT. But the idea is that basically you have a, a core uh, uh, a rod that essentially moves uh, in and out of this particular gauge using essentially properties of electricity and magnetism. What happens is the uh, uh, reading that, that electro or that magnetic field, we can determine uh, that rod's position uh, within the, uh, the LVDT. But the device is not really measuring distance or, or deflection. What it's doing is it's measuring voltage and it's taking that voltage and it's doing a conversion and converting that back into a, a given distance. That one's a little tougher to explain because it requires a little, the calcs get a little more interesting. One that's, that's really a, a little easier to explain is what's called a strain gauge. Now, this is a, a, an image of, of a strain gauge and, and essentially what's going on is you've got this almost looks like a postage stamp and it's this kind of flimsy little material and if you notice on the postage I call it a postage stamp but uh, it's this uh, it's this plastic film type material you notice we've got this sort of print and we've got this wire that sort of goes like that everybody see that okay I'm curious uh, help, help me out with this in physics do you all do anything with like resistance with like electricity in that class uh, and 
Now that we switched the curriculum, I'm going to take a wild guess that nobody had circuits yet. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, no big deal. All right, so um, there's a very uh, uh, fundamental relationship uh, in electricity and circuits called Ohm's Law. Has anybody heard of Ohm's Law? Okay, that's a little more familiar. Okay, good. All right, so Ohm's Law is basically the relationship between the amount of voltage and the amount of current that you have in a particular circuit, and it's a function of resistance, okay? Everybody's heard that term resistance before, right? Well, the idea uh, is this. You take this, uh, you take this uh, strain gauge and you adhere it to a particular element. You're basically using this fancy formulation of superglue. That's, that's basically what it is. So you adhere that to a given element and you take it and you load it, all right? So let's say you load it. What happens to the element? It gets longer, right? If the element gets longer, this is going to get longer, right? Everybody okay with that? Well, what you're doing is this. You're feeding a, uh, a small amount of electricity into that strain gauge, something like 10 millivolts or something like that, okay? <coughs> you're feeding in 10 millivolts, and then you're reporting out well, how many volts you're getting uh, uh, as an output. So feed in a little bit and record what you get out. As the element gets longer, what you're doing is you're changing the length of this strain gauge, so you're changing the resistance, okay? So because you change the resistance, what happens is you feed in a voltage, you get out a different voltage, okay? So that change in voltage, you take that, do a little bit of math, and you can convert that into a strain. And if you got a strain, you can take that and convert it into a stress or a deformation. And that's how a strain gauge works, so, so yeah. Any questions? I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to expect you all to do strain gauge math or calculations or drive any of that stuff. I just want you to have a general understanding of, of how this stuff works. Everybody good? The strain gauge uh, becomes, uh, it, it becomes, uh, it gets incorporated in a lot of other measuring devices. This is one that I throw in there just so you can see it. Uh, I don't, I personally don't use it uh, very much and I don't think it's used a whole lot, but it is used uh, here and there. It's what's called a, a, a proving ring. The idea is that if you're applying some load, what you can do is, you know, you've got this very uh, 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 precisely calibrated, essentially, uh, metallic ring. And as that compresses, uh, you can record uh, uh, the resulting force. I don't see that used as much nowadays as I see uh, this. This is what's called a, a load cell. Uh, a load cell is, is little more than a super duper fancy hyper accurate bathroom scale. So the idea is that you are applying load to it and it will record the resulting force. But the way that it does that is you're using these very, very precisely machined uh, 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 components with very high grade uh, metallic alloys. And essentially the way they work is you've just got a bunch of strain gauges uh, built inside there. You're taking that strain gauge, recording the voltage, and then your software is going back and, and uh, recording the force. So it's a very, uh, again, another very, uh, 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 common example of an indirect uh, measuring device. Uh, any questions about that difference between what a direct measuring device is and what an indirect measuring device is? It's important to mention because it can introduce a little bit of variability uh, in your measurements and you want to, uh, you want to uh, uh, account for that. Speaking of, we do need to talk a little bit about variability in measurements. Again, like I said, my, my general philosophy is any day with controlled demolition is a good day. So let's go back to this table. So I went and I broke this table. How much did it fail at? 800 pounds? Let's say I'm feeling really destructive and I break all the tables in this room, okay? Which is not going to make for a good semester for you all because you aren't going to have any desks. But imagine if I did that is, you tell me, you think every single table in this room is going to fail at exactly 800 pounds exactly? Of course not. There's going to be variability uh, of all sorts from one table to the next. Uh, for instance, right off the bat, I see the surface of this, uh, these tables are made of wood, right? Wood is an organic material. One sample of wood is going to behave differently than another, guaranteed. Okay? Make sense? Now, the other thing, um, I imagine uh, that these tables were produced in some automated fashion, or at least partially in some automated fashion. You know, like there was some factory or, or automated process or assembly process that produced the components of this table. But if I had to guess, um, these tables probably arrived on campus in pieces, right? 
them. What happened to those pieces? They were put together by people, right? So people, there's going to be a fair amount of variability in the quality of construction of this table and the quality of construction in this table. And likewise with every other table uh, in the room. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? So the source, there are a number of sources of variance. One is the material itself. Again, I go back to, to my example with wood. This piece of wood is going to behave differently than this piece of wood. Uh, your measuring methods, your sampling methods, your testing methods. Again, if we were talking about aggregate, we could be pulling from the same source. You're going to get a sample and you're going to get a sample. There are going to be different samples. You're going to get different results. That needs to be uh, uh, accounted for. So if we're looking at a number of different measurements, you know, for instance, when we do our, our mix designs, we're going to be testing a number of, uh, of different cylinders. Uh, because of that, we're going to get different data. So um, different data means the introduction of a little bit of statistics. That's one, another one of those classes that I can see you all are just having a hard time containing your excitement about, right? I love that stuff, right? Oh, yeah, always. Um, so, Sam, um, uh, in order to uh, 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 discuss this, we need to talk a little bit about sampling. So, first off, when we discuss uh, sampling, uh, what I'm talking about is, uh, again, you know, if, if we're looking at a project where you're, you're casting hundreds and hundreds of yards of concrete, you draw off uh, some samples to do some quality assurance uh, testing. You really want your samples to be two things. Number one, you want them to be random. You, know, you don't want any bias in the selection uh, of those samples. And you want them to be representative. So that's really your main goal when you're, when you're drawing a sample uh, for testing. Um, <coughs> your sample size, well, that's a function of a number of things, the testing standard, um, what it is that you're, you're actually investigating. Uh, so that, that's not the biggest deal in the world, but it's something that uh, uh, that needs to be considered. One, one point I will mention is that the bigger your sample size, the more variability you're introducing uh, in your experiment. If you take a, a given you know, material test or a given experiment and you do it a number of uh, different times, you should get the same result theoretically. But in real life, you're going to get a little bit of variability. That means looking at some fundamental statistics, things like the mean, things like the standard deviation, I assume you all have seen this stuff before, right? I know my folks that had me for 111. I know we, we spent a little bit of time uh, doing that. So, um, But yeah, just make sure you're aware of this. I'm not going to, uh, m you know, this isn't a statistics class. What I'm more interested in is, do you, you know, if, if you don't remember uh, how to get your calculator to do it, uh, I've got a playlist for Engineering 111. You can check that out. Um, or Excel. Uh, we'll probably be using Excel and things like that um, more for, uh, for this stuff. <coughs> so everybody in here has had 111, right? Or engineering computations or knows how to use Excel. Okay, good. All right, you're engineers. You should know how to use Excel. Okay. Um, because there's variability, again, we want to uh, introduce uh, some, some fundamental probability and statistics uh, concepts. I'm sure you all have heard of or at least seen the bell curve at some point uh, or another the normal distribution. Uh, it's one of the most fundamental uh, probability distributions that we use uh, in mathematics and science. It basically describes uh, general uh, uh, populations that occur uh, uh, just about everywhere in nature. Um, the area under the curve between two values will essentially tell you the probability that that occurrence is going to occur. So if you're looking at some sample and you want to know well, what's the probability that uh, you know, if I do a bunch of testing and I get the average uh, strength of some concrete is 5,000 psi, and I have a standard deviation of 500 psi, I can ask myself, well, what's the probability that it's larger than 6,000? So I can determine the area under this curve uh, past the standard deviation, and it'll give me that uh, that probability. Again, this isn't a probability and statistics class, but I just wanted to uh, review some of this stuff so that if standard deviations and averages and things like that come up later. I just don't want it to be like the bucket of water in the face that everybody kind of remembers this stuff that I've brought it up, uh, brought it up before. <coughs> uh, a couple other uh, things. This is stuff you probably haven't seen before, but I really don't think that there's any magic to, uh, to things like control charts. Uh, control charts are uh, essentially are a way of plotting the results uh, of tests as the uh, test goes on. So instead of just you know, doing your test and collecting the 
data, the idea is, okay, let's record the data from test one, let's record the data from test two, test three, test four, test five. And then as we uh, our test, let's plot our results as that goes on. There, there's a really significant um, benefit to that if you're in the, uh, uh, in the real world or doing materials testing for a given project. The idea is that if you start to notice, you know, a trend, let's say, you know, you're doing quality assurance uh, uh, cylinder testing on a given project, and the specification says the concrete needs to achieve a, a compressive strength of 5,000 PSI, so you start doing tests, and then at some point you start to notice that your control chart's dipping and dipping and dipping. You're like, oh, so there's something wrong with the mix. So you can say, hey, guys, we got, we got to stop this, you know, we need, we need to check and see what's going on. So they, they give you a really uh, nice way of detecting trouble uh, early. They give you the running uh, picture of what's going on throughout the project. So I don't want to say it, does, to say it decreases variability, that's an easy way of putting it. I think the best way of putting it is it's giving you the big picture of what's going on uh, a, a little bit better. So um, again, this is really important for things like quality assurance and, uh, and quality control. And there are other ways of going about this instead of just reporting or uh, plotting the, uh, the, the, just the individual sample results. You can do things like a, uh, an X bar chart where you're just, uh, instead of plotting the, uh, uh, the individual sample, you can plot the average as it moves on or, or plot the range as it moves on. So again, another uh, couple of ways to, uh, 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 to look at this, this concept. Any questions? Any questions at all? I know, statistics, it just takes the wind out of you, doesn't it? Don't worry, we're, we, got, we made it through it. We made it through. 126. Everybody good so far? All right. I think what I'm going to do, I know I didn't post the notes, but I, I do want to at least maybe, uh, uh, maybe introduce our first material. We're going to be seeing uh, this material um, uh, very soon in the lab, so it's probably a good idea to mention it. I was thinking I might, I might get to aggregate, so I thought I, I might mention it again. I, ha I haven't posted these yet. I'll, I'll post these as soon as uh, class or cla as soon as lab is over, um, or if I have time, I might turn them on uh, in between class and lab. But I wanted to at least mention uh, and get started uh, on aggregates. So aggregates are the first material that we are going to investigate in this class, and. And I guarantee you it's one of the most fundamental um, tasks and, and skills, you know, being able to assess aggregates that you all need to learn as civil engineers. I can't tell you the number of students who have gotten internships or who have gotten uh, 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 work at, you know, DOH or, 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 you know, places like Martin or, or engineering or places like that. And over the summer, they come and they say, well, what about, what, what have you been doing all summer? Uh, civ analyses. I've been, you know, you know doing and testing aggregates. I see there's somebody shaking their head. Have you done civ analyses before? Yeah. Okay, all right. So so you know exactly what I'm talking about. So you're going to, uh, you, tell you what, you can just lead lab next week, all right? So. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, competency is a curse. Remember that. Once you're good at something, then you have to do it, you know. You all will learn that. Okay. Um, what I mean by aggregate is, is essentially, a, you know, crush, we're looking at, at uh, you know, crushed rock and stone used for civil engineering purposes. Now, aggregates tend to be used for two primary purposes. One of them is the underlying material subgrade and things like pavements, like roads, uh, uh, foundations, uh, and whatnot. That's one very uh, 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 fundamental um, use of aggregates. But another one is ingredients in things like asphalt concretes or the big one, Portland cement concrete. Now, you've probably heard people call it rock or stone, aggregate. It's called aggregate, okay? So just, just remember that. Like things, you don't, you don't pour concrete, you place concrete. So just, just we're engineers. We've got to use the proper terminology. <laughs> um, aggregates, uh, they, they tend to come from, uh, na they can come from, you know, natural locations, things like quarries, uh, gravel pits, uh, natural sand deposits, things like that. Uh, you can also manufacture aggregate uh, from pulverized concrete. You, know, you can you re recycle concrete uh, and get aggregate from that. You can also get it from things like slag from steel mills uh, and what have you if you've got steel mills uh, in the given area. So um, one of the, the big points I want to bring up about aggregate is um, 
Aggregate is one of those materials that I think is, is very, very driven by your locality. More often than not, you're going to get aggregate from a given site locally or within the given area. So if you're working in the Huntington area and you're working in the Morgantown area, your local aggregates are going to have different properties. So it's definitely something uh, that needs to be uh, considered. Um, don't want to get too much into the geological uh, aspects, but you all probably know the three classifications of rock from geology, you know, igneous, sedimentary, metamorphic. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> geology is awesome, right? Isn't that what it is? What's that? <laughs> what? <laughs> I just needed to check the time there for a second. Wow. Geology rocks. <laughs> oh, man. I love this job. Uh, um, okay, so you, <laughs> you all know the three classes of, of, of rocks, you know, igneous, sedimentary, metamorphic. You know, all of them can be used successfully in, uh, in civil engineering applications. Just, you know, uh, make sure that you know the properties. That's really one of the biggest uh, components uh, of this stuff. And that's what we're trying to, to learn in this class is the properties of a given aggregate. Um, while we're not doing this this week, we will really be doing it uh, next week. Um, now, while I said, you know, uh, rock and stone, they're typically not, not uh, you know, scientifically we call them aggregate, there is uh, an accepted nomenclature for different sizes uh, of aggregate, and that is the difference between what is coarse aggregate and fine aggregate. So if you ever hear me use the term gravel, Gravel refers to coarse aggregate. If you ever hear me use the term sand, I'm talking about a fine aggregate. And, and what we're talking about is the difference between the size of the given elements. I mean, if, you, you know, if we want to look at this simply, I mean, aggregate really is a, a collected you know, bunch of smaller and smaller pieces of rock. Well, what defines uh, uh, you know, the properties of a given aggregate? A lot of it is size. Um, the big delimiter between uh, coarse aggregate and fine aggregate is whether it passes through a particular sieve. For most uh, uh, civil engineering aspects, we say that uh, the, the delimiter between what is a coarse aggregate and what is a fine aggregate is whether it passes a particular sieve, uh, specifically the number four sieves. That's like a big one uh, in this class. What's the difference between a coarse aggregate and fine aggregate? The coarse aggregate is what will stay on the number four sieve. The fine aggregate is what will pass the number four sieve. And you're going, what's a number four sieve? What is all this? I'll mention this, and then we'll, uh, uh, we'll call it. So this is just a zoom in of what coarse and fine aggregate uh, tend to look like. I think that's a pretty good idea, or pretty, pretty simple to, to understand. This is something I was mentioning earlier, uh, the concept of workability. I guarantee you this coarse aggregate is going to result in a concrete that is much more workable than this one because of the surface texture uh, of, the, uh, of the aggregate. That's just, uh, that's food for thought uh, for later. Now, <clears throat> one of the ways that we classify aggregates, I think I'm going to stop it here because I don't want to get too far into the, uh, into the world of, uh, of uh, aggregates. I want to uh, sort of stop after this and I'm going to bring up some points on your homework. Um, but like I said, uh, uh, the, del the delimitation between what is a coarse aggregate and a fine aggregate is whether or not it passes through a, uh, a given sieve. One of the big tasks and one of the big uh, uh, concepts I want you to learn in this class is how to perform a gradation analysis or what's commonly referred to as a sieve analysis. Given a particular sample of uh, coarse aggregate, fine aggregate, what have you, the idea is to determine its gradation. Is, is it a well-graded aggregate? Is it uniformly graded uh, and what have you? And to do that, you have to perform a sieve analysis. You basically stack a series of sieves, pour your uh, uh, aggregate into that nest of sieves, and then after it's been agitated, weigh the uh, contents on each sieve so you can determine the distribution of the particle size. Now, larger sieves are designated in inches. So if you had a three-inch sieve, each of the, or the openings between these, you know, these, these, these particular openings, they'd be three inches wide. So there's three inch sieves, two and a half inch sieves, a two inch, one and a half, uh, or so on and so forth, until we get to a quarter inch. Now a quarter inch sieve, a quarter inch sieve, the openings 
are one fourth of an inch. Okay, so that's a quarter inch set. The numbers where it has like number 30, number 40, number 100 are the number of openings per inch. So it might be a little confusing because you might think, well, a quarter inch sieve, the openings are a quarter inch. So isn't that the same as this where you have four openings per inch? No, because uh, you have the little wires. The wires have some thickness too. So a quarter inch sieve is a little bit bigger than a number four sieve. A number four sieve has four openings per inch, but the wires don't have zero diameter. They're a little, uh, have a little bit of thickness as well. Does that make sense? That's why there's a difference. So the number four is the delimiter between what's a coarse aggregate and a fine aggregate, and it has an opening, as you, as you uh, can see right here, uh, 4.75 millimeters. With that, any questions? Okay. With that, I think I'm going to sort of hold off. I don't want to you know, delve too deep into the world of aggregates. We, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. And, and what I'm more interested in right now is your understanding of just fundamental concepts of stress and strain, what Poisson's ratio is, the terminology, uh, what have you. Let me at least briefly bring up the homework so you all have an idea of what's going on. <laughs> okay, so this is the homework assignment that I've posted online. There's five problems, but even that's a little deceptive because the fifth problem is just do your, complete your handouts from this lab today. So, and there's not going to really be much completion to it. It's once we fill it out, you'll see it's, it's going to be, a, it's going to be done. So um, I've got four problems. Uh, let me sort of just briefly show you what's going on with these problems. So like, for instance, uh, here's the first problem. You can kind of see I've got a cylinder with a given uh, diameter and a given length that's put under a compressive load. I've given you the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio. So what I want you to determine, what I want you to determine is the final length and the final diameter. So it's going to involve things like computing the area, computing the stress, computing the strain, and then going through and computing the, uh, 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 the deflection and, and deformation. So you really want to make sure that you understand those fundamental formulas. Again, don't wait until the last second. Give it you know, a, a once over, maybe over the weekend, or at least be ready on Thursday to ask questions because it'll be due the following Tuesday. Um, 113, uh, I've given you a, a material or a series of materials and I've given you some, some goals. Like for instance, um, uh, we have a rod, it's 380 millimeters uh, long, it has a diameter of 10 millimeters. It's going to be yanked on, it's going to be subjected to a tensile load. Now, whatever the rod is made out of, it cannot get, uh, it cannot have a, a increase in length of more than 0.9 millimeters uh, and it cannot uh, yield. So here are the four materials. Do any of these materials work? And if so, which ones? So you got to go through and do the math and see uh, which materials uh, are going to work. Um, uh, last one, I've given you some uh, stress strain curves. On this problem 120, just use the second one where it has the two. Don't use the, the one here. And basically, I, I'm giving you some strains and I'm saying, well, he here's the strain. What's the result in stress? So, uh, and some similar. Uh, uh, questions on the last one. It should be uh, uh, fairly straightforward. Everybody good? Any questions on that? Again, it's not due until uh, uh, September 5th. Uh, this homework, I'll go ahead and tell you, is a little bit light because your next homework is going to be on aggregates and it is going to be a little hefty because it's going to involve some, some problems in the book and uh, some of the laboratory exercise exercises. Bleh that we have done in the interim. So I'll go ahead and tell you, this lab, there's not going to be very many calculations that go along with it, but the next lab and the labs to come, there are going to be some calculations. So, so make sure that you're keeping up to date with those as they progress. Sound good? All right. So I'm going to give you all, I guess uh, it's 1.39 right now. We'll go ahead and call it. Let's meet back here at 2 o'clock. Before, the, one of the reasons we're meeting here, at least this week, is we're going to go over some safety procedures. So I hope you all brought closed-toed shoes. So uh, if you didn't, uh, we're probably not going to let you in lab today. So, because we're going to be doing a little bit of lifting today. Um, so break. We'll see you all in 20 minutes. All right.